so should I just go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you to Jeff uh, for introducing me and to the organizers for putting this all together. Um, I am a, a big advocate of pluralism and economics. Um, and, uh, and I think that any forums that we have that promote for intellectual diversity and uh, engagement between ideas. I don't like to say clash of ideas because I, I, I want to think about the interaction between different perspectives as gains from exchange rather than clashes or debate. So uh, Frank Knight used to like to make this distinction and say democracy by discussion, not by debate. It's not about a debate. And I think it's the same thing in science. So this is a great opportunity. This is, I chose to discuss my new book, uh, which is called The Struggle for a Better World. Uh, in the title, struggle, I have a dual meaning of that term, struggle, uh, which is the first one, is that all of us as scholars are struggling to try to understand the human condition. Um, I particularly am trying to struggle to understand the human condition using the tools of economic reasoning as developed by classical political economists, the early neoclassical economists, and more modern new institutional economics with a very strong focus, as I'll, I'll stress here, on the Austrian school of economics. Um, but on the basis of that uh, understanding of how the world works, or at least how I have come to think about how the world works um, in those struggles, I also hope that we can identify institutional solutions that will fulfill the promise of the liberal plan for equality, liberty, and justice. And um, in, a, in a simple mantra, uh, you know, from the kind of perspective of economics that I pursue, uh, you focus on the institutional problems and they require institutional solutions. And so it, the, the problem doesn't reside in the people. The problem doesn't reside in nature. It resides in the rules of the game, both formal and informal, um, by which we interact with each other and we interact with nature. And so if we see some kind of forms of dysfunction or uh, problems that create injustice or inequality or uh, you know, oppression, what we wanna do is we wanna identify those institutional problems and then propose institutional solutions. And economics, the first part, the scholarship, can feed into that second part of how it is that we can try to be citizens within the society that we live in, within the global society, to address these institutional shortcomings. So this is the table of contents of the book. The book is made up mainly of uh, speeches that I have been given the chance um, as an officer or as an invited guest or whatnot to learned societies over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and it's bookended by an introduction and conclusion, which tries to frame the discussion in light of our current uh, situation. And so, you know, if you read in those introductions and conclusions, you know, you can get my sort of take on some of the uh, topics of, of the day having to do with inequality uh, or structural inequality and, and issues having to do with race and discrimination and, and, uh, and the promise of whether or not how we can have a fulfillment of that liberal promise in the future. Um, but the essays themselves deal with the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, um, and they deal with uh, the critique of, of uh, neoliberalism uh, to some extent. Um, they deal with the idea of having to rebuild uh, the liberal project in the 21st century. And, um, and, and, well, and, I'll, and I'll explain some more um, here. So one of the key things are part of uh, what I said was this tradition from classical economists to the early neoclassical economics to the more modern new institutional economics was that, um, and this is a wonderful book that I recommend to everyone by Lionel Robbins, The Theory of Economic Policy in English Classical Political Economy. And one of the hypotheses uh, that he puts forth, conjectures about the way the world 
of ideas have evolved is he sees a coevolution of political liberalism and economic science. And I, and I want to stress, you know, this, this is not the ideology aspect of economic liberalism. It's that, you know, when you go to do your economic analysis, you treat certain institutions as fixed and given, and then that's going to provide a structure of incentives as, and, a, and a, a flow of information that allows individuals to be able to process and adjust and adapt. And what Robbins is talking about is that when we talk about economics as if it's in a vacuum, we miss the idea that economics is really embedded within institutional structures. And those institutional structures are what make kind of, quote unquote, the invisible hand proposition have any kind of saliency, not the behavioral assumptions um, or the modeling assumptions, which is the way modern neoclassical economics uh, from 1930s to 1980, you know, did things. Um, and so that's, you know, pushing back on this is the importance of the institutional framework. So David Hume stressed to us in the treatise of human nature that you have property, contract, and consent. And it's on the basis of those institutions of property, contract, and consent that you can start to have civil society. Um, you know, one easy way to think about what I'm doing in the essays is just to ask yourself the thought experiment. Since David Hume talked about property, contract, and consent, why did we all of a sudden need in the post-1950 era for Armin Alchin and Ronald Coase and others to reinvent the discussion of property, contract, and consent? And Jeff will appreciate this. You can go back and even look at John Commons. And, you know, why is it, John, as John Commons writes in The Legal Foundations of Capitalism, why is it that that knowledge was lost in economics and what did it take to regain it? And what Robbins is doing in this book is pointing out this co-evolution of institutions of liberal democracy and the rise of economic science, which treated that framework as given. The problem with treating a framework as given is that it often then becomes forgotten. And so then thinkers have to re-examine it. And that's part of the whole process of examining it. So the importance of the framework is stress first. The examination of the framework, which is how do I go about, once I recognize the importance of the framework, how do I go about studying the framework? And one of the claims by economists like myself or influenced by people like James Buchanan or Hayek is that you shouldn't be content to treat institutions as given, but must examine how they came about using the tools of economic reasoning. Um, and then final thing is that the economic process within the framework, how do I analyze that? And so if economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place, we're gonna be looking at how it is that institutional frameworks change the nature of those exchange relationships and all that follows from that. And that's what I try to do, uh, you know, in, in the various uh, essays in here. So how about these social problems? You know, remember I said it's the liberal plan of, uh, you know, equality, liberty, and justice. Um, what about like, is, is economics uh, able to address social ills? Those social problems are, you know, the easiest way to think about them is the beverage uh, you know, report in the five giants, right? So you have um, the problems of, of, of poverty, of ignorance, of squalor, of uh, disease, and of idleness, okay? And, and, you know, somehow we need to address these things. And a lot of people think economists have a uh, blind eye to these injustices in the world. And one of the things I want to have tried to argue in these various essays is that that's not accurate, that economists have always understood um, the problem, the, the issues of social problems, or at least the economists that I'm working with. And no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater of the members are poor and miserable. That's from Adam Smith. And so it's always important that the question was never, oh, you know, there is no poor, you know, the world or you know, poverty will always be with us, so we can't do anything about it. That's not at all the question. The question it was always was, what is the most effective way to both minimize human suffering while maximizing human flourishing? And that was against the constraints of nature. So we have scarcity and trade-offs. It required the coordinating of distant and desperate individuals, productive specialization, 
assuring cooperation among a multitude of strangers to realize mutual benefits of exchange, and raising the welfare of the least advantage, which is how you have peace and prosperity. Now, just again, to capture back to Adam Smith, you know, if you go and read the, the famous passage about the booker, butcher, the baker, and the brewer, go read the page before that, where Smith puts the puzzle forward to everyone, which is that scarce in our lifetime, do we have the opportunity to, to make but a few close personal friends, but we require for our daily survival, cooperation of multitudes that we'll never meet in our life. And so this is this idea of how can you have cooperation and anonymity? Well, the way that you can have cooperation and anonymity, since you can't rely on trust from face-to-face -face trust, is you have to have institutions that serve that role of providing for the trust and the surety of the contracts and, and, and all the rest. So this is the, the, the Smithian idea. Again, it's important to stress that in systematic economic science that Adam Smith was critiquing the system of privilege. He wasn't defending the system of privilege. So the birth of economic liberalism is the same as the birth of political liberalism, which is the eradication of obstacles created by power and privilege to enable the rise of commercial society to lift humanity from the misery of poverty and subjugation uh, by unchecked authority. That's Smith's liberal plan of liberty, equality, and justice. And I guess the question that overrides this whole project is the flip side of a, of, of, a, of a question that Joseph Stiglitz asked himself in his book, Wither Socialism. So what Stiglitz asked in himself is whether or not the modern tools of economics can be used to better address the concerns of the late 19th century uh, socialist thinkers. Um, and their goal of, uh, of achieving their outcomes. And I'm asking, how is it that we can continue the Smithian plan uh, for liberty, equality, and justice, given all we've learned uh, both uh, in our theories and in the application in the world um, since that time? So um, what I'm trying to do um, in this um, is develop what I call robust political economy. Um, and robustness comes in two forms. One of them is an institutional robustness. So we want institutions that uh, work even in less than ideal circumstances. So if you, you know, to invoke another uh, thinker that I highly recommend people to read, uh, which would be Eleanor Ostrom, if you think about what she tries to show in governing the commons is she shows that there's various different mechanisms of self-governance that can occur even in situations when we least likely expect self-governance to be able to manage the problem. And so why would that be? Well, as she describes, they follow certain design principles in the way that they get the institutions to work. One of the brilliant parts of governing the commons is that she has success cases, she has failure cases, and she has transitioning cases. And so in her case studies, she can't really be accused of cherry picking, though a lot of people believe that, that that's a legitimate criticism because she does N equals one detailed studies. And I think we should be doing more case studies in economics, more field work, more economic ethnography, precisely because it's in doing economic ethnography that we're able to dig deep into the way these institutions are robust uh, against uh, you know, deviations from ideal conditions. Uh, on the other hand, I also want to hopefully build a intellectually robust argument and substitute uh, you know, worst case assumptions for my own position um, and, you know, not best case. And, and I, so I want to make the argument for my own position the hardest to make. And I want to make the position for my intellectual interlocutors the best case for their position and see, you know, whether or not those arguments can hold up. Now, that might be more aspiration than reality, but it's sort of like, you know, Daniel Dennett's rules of good argument or criticizing with kindness is, is, is a kind of a rule that I want to have, um, you know, all the time in my head. Um, whether or not I succeed at doing it or not, that's up to the reader more than myself, but I, that's what I'm trying to do. 
Um, so I mentioned earlier about the Austrian school and the role that the Austrian school plays in uh, my own work. And uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with the Austrian school, um, these are individuals like, you know, Carl uh, Manger and uh, Eugen von Bavrik and, and Friedrich Wieser as the founders. And then sort of the next generation of developers would include Joseph Schumpeter and, and Ludwig von Mises. And then uh, finally Hayek and Machlup and Morgenstern. And then the tradition migrates uh, to the UK and to the United States and elsewhere in the world. And you have other figures uh, rise up, Ludwig Lachman and Murray Rothbard and Israel Kirzner being the primaries of the next generation. And then you get basically to, you know, contemporary Austrian economics. And that's a variety of different uh, individuals throughout the world. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, including myself would be in that, that kind of world. But <clears throat> the question is, is where do the Austrians sort of make their claim to fame? And it, they, I would argue, and I argue throughout the essays in here that they make it at a methodological and analytical and social philosophical level. level. And those, uh, just for the, for speed of getting through this, um, the methodological issues would be on the implications of subjectivism, uh, subjectivism of value, subjectivism of expectations, subjectivism of knowledge. All of these kind of ideas are uh, sort of values, costs, uh, the knowledge that we process in, in, in a particular time and place, uh, the expectations that we form about how we cooperate with one another or not cooperate with one another. Um, on an analytical level, the focus is on processes uh, of adjustment and adaptation. Um, and that, of course, is at the level of the entrepreneur, uh, you know, in, within the economic system, but also maybe public entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs at the level of the rules. But it's all about the issues of institutional change and processes of change and, adapt and, and adjustment. And then at a social philosophical level, there's this appreciation for spontaneous order, uh, the self-governing capacities of, of, of individuals, and also the, the, the rise of the institutional framework itself um, that allows us to, to realize uh, productive specialization and, and mutually beneficial gains from exchange. So the basics, of the mechanics of this, this is Murray Rothbard and Israel Kirzner. Um, and uh, the, the basics of this is that, you know, this is gonna sound very sort of neoclassical uh, to start with, uh, and just a classical economics actually, which is that scarcity implies choice. We live in a world of scarcity. We can never escape scarcity. Scarcity is not about material abundance. It's about the logic of not being able to pursue two things at the same time. So scarcity implies that we make choice. Choice implies that we make trade-offs. We forego this path and pursue that path. And we must negotiate those trade-offs individually and collectively. And uh, negotiations of those trade-offs require that we have aids to the human mind. In a market society, that aid comes in the form of property prices and profit and loss. If we are outside of the realm of a market society, we are gonna end up by having other mechanisms that serve as aids to the human mind. And we're gonna to have to examine critically their effectiveness in being able to achieve the incentives, the information that we need, and the innovation that uh, would push us to lead to progress. No one says that the institutions inside of a po political process can do those things or can't do those things or within other kinds of collective entities. Um, this is not, I would, I would contend, uh, and this is mainly you know, uh, a quick nod to Jeff. Jeff has a, a wonderful paper that I just had my students actually uh, read and, and write professional comments on, uh, which is on the myth of the, of the uh, you know, uh, sort of the mystical market, the idea that the market is everywhere and, 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 and every place. And I, you know, I'm, I don't agree with that uh, claim uh, when I use the tools of studying incentives 
information or innovation, what I want to do is I want to throw those into various different institutional environments and see what is the structure of incentives and the flow of information that individuals will be able to have at their access to be able to explain their behavior so that they can negotiate the trade-offs that they face in their lives. So the idea that they face trade-offs is, of course, across the board. The way in which they negotiate their trade-offs is institutionally contingent. And so there's no universal way in which we all negotiate trade-offs. It's going to be very specific to institutions, but that's going to have a big impact on the pattern of human behavior that results, those different institutions. So again, another way to think about the framework that I'm working with, intellectual framework, is to assume you know, you have individuals and an individual animating agent. Then what you do is you throw that individual into a institutional filter and that institutional filter will produce different patterns of outcomes. So we explain the variation in outcomes, not by variation in people, but by variation in the institutions. In order to do that, we assume same players, different rules produce different games. That's different than saying, Different players, same rules produce different games. There's some truth to that. I mean, Ronaldo playing soccer is different from Pete Becky playing soccer. Even though we're playing under the same rules, the players are different. Therefore, the game is going to be different, right? But you don't need a social scientific theory to explain that. That's all explained by agent type. Or another way to think about it is initial conditions. If everything in your explanation is explained by initial conditions, then you don't really have an explanation, you have a description. And, and this is a big problem, I think, in modern institutional, new institutional economics, is that a lot of the explanation is thrust onto initial conditions, as opposed to an animating agent, an institutional filter producing different variations in outcomes. And so therefore the variation in the outcomes is a function of the variation in the institutions. At least that's the, the way that I'm trying to to leverage these ideas to build all that up. And one of the key ideas in all of this is the problem of, 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 of trying to organize the activity in a socialist manner rather than in a liberal uh, institutional manner. So again, keep in mind that socialism meant something. And that meaning of socialism was the opposite of the liberal order that I talked about earlier on. And so that meant that you had to have abolition of private property, the means of production, and a substitution of a comprehensive plan in order to realize the rationalization of production, which would give us advanced material production that would enable humanity to move from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. And in the process of doing that, you would have harmony of the different classes in society such a class conflict would be overcome. That was the promise, right? That was the promise. So the means, the aspiration is deliver us from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom and eliminate the class the, the, uh, and produce harmony among the classes. So that's the end. The means to achieve that was the abolition of private property and the substitution of a comprehensive plan. The question is, are those means capable of achieving those ends. And Ludwig von Mises, as I mentioned earlier, the, the you know, generation of economists that comes after the founders of the Austrian school. But I should point you to Max Weber um, in an essay in 1917, uh, um, which he also addresses the problems of, of, of a socialist economy, or for that matter, uh, Friedrich Wieser, who discusses the problems that would be confronted as well. Um, and, uh, and Mises is building on those ideas. And his argument goes forward very simple. Without private property and the means of production, there'd be no market for the means of production. Without a market for the means of production, there'd be no market prices established for those means of production. Without prices reflecting the relative scarcity of the means of production, there'd be no way for economic decision makers to rationally calculate the alternative uses of those resources. And without the ability to engage in rational economic calculation, this first project, the rationalization of the process of production, is not going to be possible. And so that means socialist means are incapable of achieving the socialist aspirations. And that's true then, and it's true today. There's no, been no mechanism 
that has evolved that actually explains how it is that socialist planners would be able to achieve socialist aspirations. What you can do is you can build a model in which the socialist planner knows everything in advance and therefore is able to evade the problem. But that's, you know, assuming that you have an omniscient and omnipotent central planner also add in there the, the, the idea that they are benevolent and you get the, the, the general you know, thrust of things, which is, can we actually think about modeling economic life without assumptions of omniscience, omnipotence, and benevolence? And if we do, and, and, and what would the world look like in that? And so part of the intellectual history battle is to see that in my claim, which is contestable, right? Obviously, is, is that I'm claiming that the classical economists, the early neoclassical economists, and the modern sort of new institutional economists that I'm relying on, they don't rely on the assumptions that are omniscience, omnipotence, and benevolence. They, in fact, are explicit in their rejection of those. And then they look at the same phenomena through that different prism. And then that leads to different kind of answers to the question of, if there's institutional problems, what are the institutional solutions to those problems? So the reason why this methodological debate is so, uh, I mean, this socialist calculation debate is so important isn't just because of that socialist claim. It's actually the broader issue of having its methodological importance, its analytical importance, and its practical importance. And I, I, the main one on the methodological importance is the, the shortcomings of formalism. If, uh, as Paul Romer refers to it, mathiness, or in a more recent paper that I really recommend uh, young people in here to look at, which is Brian Author's uh, most recent paper having to deal with an economics that's appropriate for verbs as opposed to an economics that's grounded in nouns, uh, and, and look at the contrast between those, those two. So when tractability in the modeling space becomes the criteria of how we build our economic theories, we can be misled very seriously. And that's one of the difficulties of formalism. So there's no doubt that confusion creeps into social science when we use the same words to mean different things or different words to mean the same thing. And therefore, when we try to substitute in a universal language, let's say mathematics, for the nuances of natural language, um, you know, that there's some logic behind that and there's some reason why. One of my teachers was uh, Kenneth Bolding. And uh, I asked uh, Kenneth, well, he always made us call him Mr. Bolding. And I asked him uh, one time, I said, Mr. Bolding, I said, how come everyone became a logical positivist in economics? And he laughed and he chuckled. He had a characteristic, he, was a stu he, he stuttered. Uh, but he, his stuttering never actually blocked communication and actually emphasized the points. It was a, a unique kind of thing with him. But he, he says to me, he says, oh, my dear Peter, who would ever want to be an illogical negativist? Um, right. And so he, he was trying to communicate to us about the importance of, of the language that people use in promoting the ideas. And so when you're debating and, and, and whatnot, Again, Balding has a great little piece where he is arguing against Samuelson and the mathematization of economics. It's in the JPE. And he argues that the progress in the social sciences might come from the literary borderland between economics and sociology, not in the pristine formalism of the mathematical model. But of course, the economics profession went in the Samuelson direction, not in the Bolding direction. And that was a faithful choice. They were the first, they were, you know, uh, the first two John Bates Clark medal winners. OK, and so Samuelson and then and then and then Bolding. But the economics profession went in the Samuelsonian direction, not in the Bolding direction. And it's an interesting thought experiment if you trace out what economics might look like today had we gone in the Bolding direction. But. So this methodological importance of the uh, ability to understand that we need semantic clarity, not necessarily just syntactic clarity. We need to have an economics for verbs and, and human activity, not for states of affairs. Um, um, and, and that, you know, the socialist calculation debate put forth 
front and center. The second thing about it is the issue of the analytical importance and the focus on institutions and processes. Um, again, you know, in the middle of the debate, Oscar Longa, Abel Lerner, uh, uh, um, you know, they stressed the idea that incentives were not an acceptable, uh, you know, discussion point in the debates because in the model space, they didn't have room for those institution specific incentive generations. In fact, Longa accuses Mises of being an old style institutionalist uh, for thinking that private property rights had something to do with the ability of the economic system to coordinate and cooperate um, uh, in, in the way that it did. And so the debate forced individuals to focus again on things like property rights, bureaucracy, processes of adjustment, entrepreneurship within a market, and, and these other kinds of things. So again, this debate had a very big impact. And then final, and for modern times, obviously, the debate comes to a kind of a crashing halt because of events in the world. And so you get the post-communism period, and that raises all kinds of questions about what are the institutions that need to train, ch uh, change, how can you get institutional change, how that's related to economic performance. And that also relates to the broader question of development economics um, that, uh, and, and, and what is the difficulties? Why are we having such frustration with our efforts to engage in foreign assistance and, and these other kinds of things? Um, so now, one of the, the main ideas, this picture over here, in the upper left is street art from America. And uh, what it says is help, this economy is killing us. And this is the current generation of individuals. And one of the main themes that runs throughout the book is this notion of tacit presuppositions. That is, those tacit presuppositions are the givens that intellectuals hold that they don't even question because they uh, are, uh, you know, what are taken as the primordial facts of the world. And that is up for grabs at, at different generations. So it, it, for those of you old enough, think about the, you know, what happened to economics after the Great Depression and the rise of Keynesian economics. And then think about what happened in economics after 1980 and then after 1989, in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, the, 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 the tacit presuppositions that economists held about the nature of the market order and the nature of government. And now think about those tacit presuppositions that young people hold today. Remember that the kids that are in college today were born, they never saw the Soviet Union. All right. Uh, all they've known, and I'm talking now in the United States, is that we're in a permanent war economy since 9-11, that we had a global financial crisis, which led to economic disruption. Um, and we now had uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, which also led again to economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of disruptions and, and exacerbation of various different injustices and, and whatnot. And so what I try to argue in the book is that um, liberals made a serious error. So the Milton Friedman liberal types, uh, you know, influence, Adam Smith wearing tie folks made a serious mistake after 1989 because they ceded the intellectual or cultural ground to non-liberals because they thought that liberalism had won. And so therefore the ideas lost energy and they became complacent and there was lack of creativity. Um, and, uh, you know, again, just to mention Jeff, you know, Jeff has his, his, his trilogy of books, uh, Wrong Turnings, uh, the, 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 the Feasibility of Socialism, and then the most recent book on liberal solidarity. What Jeff is doing is, sh is showing lack, uh, uh, excuse me, showing a lack of complacency and a, er a, a, a surplus of creativity. He's thinking through these questions again from a different perspective than my own, but one that I greatly appreciate and in fact learn from all the time, precisely because he's understanding that politics is downstream from culture. 
that, uh, you know, we don't focus on politics per se, but on the intellectual arguments and culture. And then it's that culture that then influences the ability of politics downstream. And we have to constantly fight the complacency and lack of creativity to get back again to this idea. So what do I sort of say, I only have two slides left. Um, so I'll try to finish these up very quickly. So what I, one of the ways to think about what I'm trying to argue in the book is that, you know, for the new generation of liberal political economists, they need to learn from Milton Friedman. And what do they need to learn from him? The ability to think and communicate with clarity and compassion to your peers, to your students and the general public. Relevance is not a vice. Um, but there is a difference between being policy relevant or a policy wonk. And a lot of people, when they go into the being relevant, they become policy wonky. And that's not necessarily the case. We want sort of you to recognize that it's not about the momentary politics of the day, but instead it's about clarity in presenting the, the principle and communicating that principle to your scientific peers, to your students, and to the general public learn from Buchanan uh, and the challenge of the elitist presuppositions. And they dominate uh, what he calls in the British context, the Harvey Road presuppositions, or what you would call in the United States, the Harvard, uh, you know, brain trust, uh, you know, uh, presuppositions. Um, one way to, to think about this is that the kind of argument that I'm giving says, ordinary people can do extraordinary things if given the freedom to behave and, and pursue their goals. Whereas the elitist view is that extraordinary people can do extraordinary things if given the power to pursue those. And we see this being played out all the time, including over the last 18, uh, 15 months. And Buchanan raises some very serious ideas. So we should caution our fellow economists to cease offering, uh, pro, uh, offering policy advice as if to a benevolent despot, understand that we're dealing with these, you know, agents that are neither omniscient, omnipotent, nor benevolent when we're interacting in, in these spaces. And we learn from Hayek and excite the minds of the next generation of thinkers with a sense of awe about the market order and a sense of purpose about the practice of economic science and the art of political economy. And finally, I think we can learn from Adam Smith. And it always pays well to go back and learn from Adam Smith. One of the things that's amazing, I find, in reading Adam Smith's theory of money, uh, moral sentiments is his kindness and generosity of spirit. And I think that that is very much needed in the world today. And at the same time, when you read The Wealth of Nations, you have this analytical acuteness and historical judgment. I don't see those two books in juxtaposition to one another, I see them as actually merging with one another. And then my final slide is just that I hope that people take from this the idea of the four pillars of economics, which is the truth and the light, which is tied to scarcity and trade-offs, awe and beauty, which is tied to spontaneous order and complex coordination, and then hope, which is to be seen through that progress and improvement is possible by changes in the rules of social interaction and compassion, that those improvements fall to, the, to improve the welfare of the least advantaged and the eradication of the privilege through, through the power of the market as opposed to yielding to privilege uh, through the power of the state. So with that, I will end uh, my share screen and hopefully have a conversation with some people. Thank Peter, you. That, Peter, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. I, I find it very, very difficult to disagree with anything you say. You know that you and I have some dis disagreements, sure. but I agree with every, every, every word in your talk, and I found it extremely inspiring. Thank so um, I'd like to ask th to thank you first warmly for that, and also to ask for any uh, contributions or, or questions. Uh, please let me see the, our YouTube channel for a question. I'm checking our YouTube channel. <laughs> there's, no, there's no questions on the chat. 
there is a question. I will direct you. Wait, please. I will write our uh, channel, our chat line. Wait, please. I can't see it. No, no, no. no. Uh, I wrote it now. Okay. Wait, please. Uh, can you see the question? Oh, yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. yeah. Can you see that, Peter? It's about <laughs> yes, Richard Wagner's interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm going to first just make a, take the, the, the privilege of being able to respond to something with Jeff, which is that uh, I think that the project that you have for liberal solidarity um, follows very nicely from the open letter that you have to modern libertarians that they need to be uh, paying a lot more attention to where there was a mistake maybe in the language and in the attitude towards things which are illiberal. Uh, so you can't use illiberalism to get liberalism. That's the main issue. And you can't forget that it's all about solidarity at some fundamental level. And so I, I, that's what society is about. That's what the emphasis on community is, is for. And, I, I, and so I think that's right. And I think that we have to actually have a more robust political economy, which deals with states, markets, and society in yeah. equal weight, rather than the idea that we treat them as, you know, maybe states, market, society, or markets, state, society, or something <laughs> like that, right? And certainly the dichotomization right, yeah. of markets and states. And the reason why this relates is because Professor Wagner, who's, who's brilliant, uh, and I... Uh, love being his colleague um, at George Mason University. And uh, he developed what he calls entangled political economy. And in his entangled political economy, what he has is he doesn't have the dichotomization of state versus market or state versus market versus society. He has all those things interacting. And so that has led him to now think about, can we imagine a economics. So he doesn't like hyphenated economics, right? So he's an Austrian economist, but he doesn't want to call himself Austrian economics. He wants to call himself a Wagnerian economist, right? He doesn't want to be, you know, tied to Menger or Mises or Hayek or anyone. So what he's doing, he's a lifelong learner. And so what he's doing now is building on uh, systems theory and agent-based models, uh, agent-based computational models. Now, you know, what have we seen of that? He has some out, outstanding students uh, that have worked in this field. Uh, Jimmy Canton up at, at North Dakota State, Abigail Devereaux, who's now at Wichita State. Uh, you know, we at George Mason have an outstanding center for social complexity, which is headed by uh, Rob Axtell, and he interacts with all of them. And so I just don't know what the outcome of all that will be. Uh, Jeff can, can agree, can, it can sorry he edits a journal and, and what he can, can confirm this we've been hearing about the great benefits of agent based computational models and complexity theory now for over 20 years right so this is not something that's brand new and it yet hasn't quite busted through right i mean in some level it's important you have people like you know uh alan kerman and you know brian author and all kinds of very important thinkers that i recommend to everyone my good friend roger koppel but it, it hasn't captured the imagination yet but maybe good ideas don't always have to capture the imagination remember what i said earlier about kenneth bolding versus paul samuelson i much would have preferred if kenneth bolding would have been the future direction of economics rather than, than Paul Samuelson. No knock on Paul Samuelson, but you know, I think Boulding would have bore better fruit. But so I think Wagner is fascinating. His most recent book is on macroeconomics as systems theory, but I really recommend his work on entangled political economy and his book in Austrian economics, which is called Mind, Society and Human Action. It's really, really a challenging and very important book. So I hope that answers that question. Um, what do I think about egalitarian liberalism? Well, there's a fantastic new book out by David Levy and Sandra Pert by Cambridge. And it's called Toward an Economics of Natural Equals. And it's about the Virginia School of Political Economy. 
And, um, and, and, and so I think that, you know, Rawls, for example, is fundamental to that project. But it's important to remember that Rawls was very influenced by Frank Knight. So early Rawls is a lot different than later Rawls in, in, in just a subtle way, which is that the earlier Rawls, let's say the Rawls of, of his essay in 1963 on, on basically the, the, the generality rule in constitutions um, and, and you know, these kind of veil of ignorance sort of uh, you know, moves that he makes. Hayek and Buchanan corresponded with one another about how brilliant this work was. And they were completely on board with it. And so the issue is what happens between 1963 and let's say 1974. And what I would say is that what happened is the influence of Knight fades some and the influence of James Mead rises, right? And so what happens is, is, is that, you know, the kind of subtle little differences in the way you think about the way in which distribution issues can be handled, whether or not distributions can be handled by within rule changes in the outcomes or whether or not you have to change the rules because the rules engender a pattern of exchange and production and thus distribution, right? The Knightian position is that you change the rules, right? That's the poker game analogy. Right. We want to have a poker game where we all can like win and it's exciting, but we also then want to make sure that we build it in so that the game continues so we don't lose everyone in the game. And so that requires you change the rules of the poker game. All right. Whereas a lot of people believe that you let the game play and then you just tax or you do, you know, some kind of other redistribution without it having an impact on the strategies that the players are going to play themselves. And so it becomes a very interesting debate over the incentive uh, aspects of the way we engage in redistribution. But I think that the questions that Simons puts on the table in, in a, for a positive program for laissez-faire, so this is, goes back again to things that Jeff has, has been fantastic in pointing out, which is that, um, you, know, the, you know, if you look at Walter Littman's book or you look at what Hayek was trying to do, which is different from Mises, so if you look at them, they, they all pay lip service to the idea that they have to come with an agenda for liberalism, right? Rather than just letting it, you know, run on its own. And so they all want to talk about positive program for laissez-faire. And if we're talking about a positive program, we have to deal with issues of injustice, all right? St structural inequality, uh, you know, all these kind of issues that we, that we look at. And when we look at real history, you know, the thumb, the, the interest groups are aligned with the state to put their thumb to benefit themselves at the expense of others. That's not, that needs to be changed or challenged. And that's what Adam Smith was doing, I would argue. And that's what, you know, what we have to do today. We have to make sure we address those questions. So, and how do we start with that? We recognize that we're one another's dignified equals. So in that regard, we are, liberalism is a form of egalitarianism rightly understood because we we recognize one another's fundamental equality and equal things demand equal treatment thanks peter a any more questions uh let me check if any again please uh, uh there is no question anymore uh thank you very much for your valuable contribution to our symposium again? Well, I greatly appreciate the opportunity and I really applaud you on what you're doing. And uh, we